To examine the bones of the lower limb, we actually have to start with the hip bone, or the os coxa. So here, while we have the femur articulating with it, we're going to put the femur aside for a moment and concentrate on this pelvic bone, or os coxa, right here. It's actually made from the combination of three different bones, the ilium, the ischium, and anteriorly here, the pubis. These all fuse together to create the single hip bone, and on its medial side we have an interesting area, it's called the auricular surface because it is ear-shaped, and this is where it articulates with the sacrum. So we're going to start off immediately with a tongue twister because the auricular surface of the ilium and the auricular surface of the sacrum articulate together. Just superior to that, we have the iliac tuberosity, a roughened area where ligaments bind it to the sacrum. And extending from there, we have the large wing, or ala, of the ilium, this large area just here. On the medial side, we have what's called the iliac fossa, where the iliacus muscle is found. And on the lateral side, we have the gluteal surface, which provides a lot of area for the gluteus medius and minimus to originate. Now if we look at the very top, and no, sorry, from posterior to anterior on its superior surface, we have what's called the iliac crest, big extended area for abdominal muscle attachment. Anteriorly we have that end at the anterior superior iliac spine, then we have an anterior inferior iliac spine, and likewise posterior we have a posterior superior and posterior inferior iliac spine. Now anytime we have these large bumps, that's going to be a site where muscles or ligaments attach, but since we're just doing a quick intro now, we're not going to belabor which ones go where. The ilium, posteriorly here, finishes with this large notch, and this is going to be called the greater sciatic notch, and it's leading to the ischial spine. But now we've left the ilium and moved to the ischium. We have the ischial spine just here. Extending from it, we have the lesser sciatic notch. And then as we go inferior, we come to this roughened area on the inferior surface of the ischium. This is called the ischial tuberosity, and it's where the hamstrings attach. So nice, big, roughened area for those muscles. Extending anteriorly is the ischial ramus, and it's going to join the pubic bone, which is this V-shaped bone just here. The pubic bone has an inferior pubic ramus and a superior pubic ramus. Now, you will note that uh, sometimes the inferior pubic ramus and the ischial ramus are mentioned together as the ischiopubic ramus, it's just referring to this area here, but together the ischium and pubic bones surround this large hole called the obturator foramen. If we look at the medial side of the ilium, we have a symphysial surface here. Now the pubic symphysis is where it's going to meet its neighbor on the other side, and there's usually fibrocartilage here to help those two interact with each other. Going a little bit more Superiorly and posteriorly, we have a large bump, and that's going to be the iliopubic eminence, where the pubic bone and the ilium meet. And then moving on to the lateral surface, we have probably the most interesting aspect of the os cocci. It's where the three bones fuse together and create this large cup, or large socket, for this ball and socket joint, and that is going to be the coxofemoral joint. That being said, let's take a look at the femur itself. It is a very long and large bone. So we're going to start by looking at its superior aspect, and we'll zoom in a little bit here. The first thing to note is the large head. So large femoral head is here, then we have the femoral neck which narrows, and that leads to two large bumps, and they're especially visible as we go posteriorly here. So the large bump lateral here is the greater trochanter, and then posteriorly and a little medial we have the lesser trochanter. Now anteriorly, these are joined by an intertrochanteric line. If we flip it to the posterior side, we can see that there's a little divot inside here. That's going to be the trochanteric fossa, part of the greater trochanter. But there's a nice stout ridge of bone between the greater and lesser trochanters here. And this is the intertrochanteric crest. So the intertrochanteric crest is quite large. And as we follow this down, there's a roughened area here on the posterior side just below where the lesser uh, trochanter is, and that's going to be the gluteal tuberosity, and that's one of the places that the gluteus maximus is going to attach to this bone. Now the shaft of the femur is very long, and its posterior side has this roughened area right down the middle, and that is called the linea aspera. 
Now let's zoom back out for a split second here and note that we've got the femoral head medially and then down here at the inferior end we've got two large articular surfaces where we meet the tibia. This is going to be the medial condyle and the lateral condyle. And if we flip to the posterior side and zoom in just a bit, we can see that they're very large posteriorly. And this is what allows uh, the huge degree of flexion that's possible at the knee. So once again, medial condyle, lateral condyle, just here. And there's a nice big intertrochanteric fossa, that gap between the two of them, just there. Now, on the anterior side, we have an area called the patellar surface, and that's going to be where our patella, or kneecap, is going to articulate. So kneecap, or patella, is just here. The patella has a base that's going to be superior. That's going to be where the quadriceps muscles are going to attach to it. So let's zoom in on him just a touch. The base is up here. The apex is the point that's going to attach it to the tibia and its anterior surface is roughened here, and its posterior surface is its articular surface. It's hopefully smoother, because that's the surface that's going to articulate with the femur. And we'll just put those two together, and if everything's okay, there should be a nice, smooth slide from one to the other. Returning to the femur, before we finish it up, let's flip to the posterior side and note that we have, once again, the lateral condyle, medial condyle, and there's a strut of bone attaching to the shaft from them, and that's a site for muscle attachment. So we have the lateral epicondyle, or the area above the condyle here. We have the medial epicondyle here, and the medial epicondyle has a distinctive little spike, or a little raised area here, called the adductor tubercle, and that's where the adductor magnus muscle is going to attach. All right, so that's the femur. Now let's see how it articulates with the next bone. That's the tibia, and this is one of the things that forms the knee joint just here. So we have the femur and tibia articulating at the knee. Take the femur out of the way, and we'll take a look at the entirety of the tibia there before zooming in on its superior aspect. Now the superior part of the tibia right here it's got a superior articular surface. It's fairly flat. It's fairly flat and it's a little bit difficult to imagine how that's stable. In real life we have some fibrocartilage structures called menisci that are helping that connect with and stay in contact with the femur. But that superior articular surface is made up of a medial condyle and a lateral condyle and it's going to take it with the medial and lateral condyles of the femur as well. Between the two is a raised area called the intercondylar eminence where our cruciate ligaments are hanging out and attaching. So, uh, anteriorly, we have an anterolateral tubercle right here leading towards a roughened area on the very anterior surface of the tibia and that is the tibial tuberosity and that's where the patellar ligament is going to attach to help us extend the knee strongly. Now flipping to the posterior side there's not a whole lot to see on the posterior side of the tibia except for a small roughened area here called the soleal line and that's where a muscle named the soleus is going to attach. So we keep on moving down the shaft of the tibia. We're going to flip back to the anterior view and here the big thing you notice is there's a large bump on the medial side. This is called the medial malleolus and on its inner surface we have an articular facet for the medial malleolus. It's continuous with the inferior side of the tibia here. This is going to be its inferior articular surface and that's what's going to allow it to articulate with the ankle. Now, I'm going to zoom out just a bit so that we can place the fibula alongside the tibia and then we'll take a closer look at it. So these two bones articulate. We have right up here a fibular articular facet on the tibia and down here we have a gap called the fibular notch. And the fibular notch is where we're going to have the fibula articulating with the tibia distally. One fun fact about this is it's a completely car uh, 
collagenous joint. It's all made of connective tissue. There's no synovial surface or kind of joint capsule within there. So now, let's take a look at the fibula. It is a very interesting bone because it's so long and so slender and so thin. Superiorly, we have its head with an articular facet where it's going to articulate with the superior tibia. So not a whole lot more for us to see even though I zoomed in, but there's the articular surface right there. The neck narrows precipitously from the head and continues as the body or shaft of the fibula just there. And we end with the lateral malleolus. This is the area hanging down and forming the lateral side of our ankle. And just as before, there's going to be an articular facet there so that the tibia and the fibula form what's known as a mortise or kind of an enclosed area that will articulate with the talus of the ankle. Now looking at these two bones together, it's worth noting that there are, kind of on each of them, a little bit of a raised ridge. It's going to be on the lateral side of the tibia and on the medial side of the fibula and that is known as the interosseous border of each bone and it exists because there's actually going to be a connective tissue structure in there called the interosseous membrane that connects the two along their length. Now, moving ahead, we'll now take a look at, once again, the mortise there meeting up with the ankle of our, what are known as tarsal bones. And that's what we're going to spend some time looking at right here. So we have the tarsal bones making up the entirety of the foot. Now because this is an introductory video, we are definitely not going to disarticulate these and look at each bone in detail. Although some programs, especially anthropology, are going to have you do exactly that. So here we start with the talus. The talus is the bone that actually articulates with the tibia and fibula. It's got this large articular surface here called the trochlea of the talus and sitting just inferior to it is the very large calcaneus or heel bone. So the calcaneus is a very, very large bone here. You can see this bulbous posterior end of it, and that is the calcaneal tuberosity, or basically our heel. So that's going to be present right there, and there's a little shelf on its lateral side that supports the talus. So I can't really separate these too much, but you can see how the talus rests on this shelf, and that shelf is called the sustentaculum, Halli. Now moving a little bit further distal, here's the talus once again, looking at it from the top or superior view, we have the navicular bone anterior to it here, and anterior to the uh, calcaneus we have the cuboid bone. Just ahead of the navicular we have three cuneiform bones. Now at this point it's usually a good idea to take a look and see if we can find where our big toe is because that's always going to clue us in as to which side is medial and which side is lateral with the little toe. So here is our medial cuneiform, our intermediate cuneiform, and our lateral cuneiform. And then once again we have our cuboid bone, most lateral in that row. Now, one thing to note here is there's a nice degree of articulation between a lot of these bones. They're not tremendously mobile, but they have articular surfaces that allow them to interact with their neighbors. And one you can see rather easily here is that articular surface between the calcaneus and the cuboid right there. All right, moving on. In the hand, we had metacarpals. Now we're in the feet, so we have metatarsals. We had the tarsal bones up here, and now we have metatarsals making up the substance of the foot. We have a first, second, third, fourth, and fifth, and just like in the hand, they are going to have a base, they're going to have a body or a shaft, and then a head distally. One thing to note is that in the foot, there's a very large prominence on the base of the fifth metatarsal, and it goes by the very, kind of a thankfully simple and descriptive name of tuberosity of the base of the fifth metatarsal, just there. Now each of these is going to lead towards the phalanges right here. Now, just as in the hand, the first is going to have just two, a proximal and a distal phalanx, so that's digit one or the hollux. The others will have a proximal, a middle, and a distal 
phalanx right there. One exception is that the little toe does not always have an intermediate, so sometimes it also has two just there. And that takes us to the end of the bones of the foot. Thank you very much.